with the recording equipment. Um, I have apology from Michael McGinsey. Any other apologies? Um, item 2 is Chair Pearson's business. Um, under this, I just want to advise members that the information on members' attendance on committee meetings during the 13-14 session will be published on the committee web page on Friday the 7th of November 2014. I uh, also just want to advise members that obviously you will be aware the Finance Minister made a statement to the Assembly on the draft budget 15-16. Uh, he, in the course of that, made reference to the head of the civil service being asked to uh, undertake a piece of work in relation to the um, oversight uh, and, and current spend uh, and to ensure that the Department of Health uh, that the additional two hundred million allocated is spent on frontline services. Um, he also referenced the possibility of an OECD review to provide independent scrutiny of the Department's spending decisions. I am seeking agreement here, members, to write to the Department of Finance and Personnel to seek further clarity on the terms of reference and timescale for the piece of work being carried out both by the Head of Civil Service and the detail on the OECD review. Okay. Members are in agreement. Great. Item 3 is the draft minutes of the meeting on Wednesday, the 22nd of October, which are on page 5. Are members content with the minutes? Great. Okay, item four is a proposed legislative consent motion, a private members' bill on the regulation of healthcare professionals. Uh, I want to refer members to page 12 of the meeting folder for the relevant papers. Advising members that departmental officials are here today to brief members on the proposed LCM in relation to the Westminster Private Members' Bill on the regulation of healthcare professionals. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, we have Heather Stevens, Director of Human Resources Directorate at the Department, Joyce Cairns, uh, who is Human Resources Directorate at the Department, Pierre <coughs> McAteer, Human Resources Directorate at the Department, and Dr. Mark Timoney, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer at the Department. So you're all very welcome. Um, Heather, I don't know if it's yourself that's taken the lead in this. I ask you to make the presentation, then we'll open up to two members. Thanks very much, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to give the committee a brief overview of how the draft bill has evolved and also some background on the decision to include Northern Ireland within its scope. In July of this year, Jeremy Hunt, MP, Secretary of State for Health, wrote to former Minister Poots seeking his agreement to a legislative consent motion in relation to provisions contained in the Private Members' Bill, which was introduced by Jeremy Lefroy, MP. Those relevant provisions relate to the regulation of healthcare professionals, which is a devolved matter in Northern Ireland, and therefore a legislative consent motion is required. The full title of the bill is the Health and Social Care Safety and Quality Bill 2014-15. And in fact, it has a wider patient safety theme following on from events at the Mid Staffordshire NHS Trust. And it includes three other patient safety related measures which apply to England only. However, it is intended that the regulatory provisions included in the bill will apply on a UK wide basis. And this is because, with the exception of pharmacy, the jurisdiction of the healthcare professional regulators affected is UK-wide. The bill, which has the full support of government, was introduced to the House of Commons on the 2nd of July 2014 and is scheduled to have its second reading debate on the 7th of November. At the time of the initial letter from Jeremy Hunt, the bill included two provisions which related to the regulation of healthcare professionals. However, the bill has since been updated, and now only one measure remains which it is proposed will extend to Northern Ireland. That provision, which seeks to introduce an overarching public protection objective for healthcare professional regulators and the Professional Standards Authority, has also been updated since it was first introduced. The Department of Health considered the provision in discussion with the regulators, which highlighted in particular that the principle of public protection must have primacy. The updated draft clause introduces an overarching objective of public protection, with further objectives relating to public health and safety, public confidence in the professions and proper professional standards and conduct, 
each with equal importance. So in exercising their functions, regulators must have regard to these. So that would be, for example, in relation to handling complaints, disciplinary hearings, fitness to practice cases. This approach therefore secures the focus on public protection, which regulators were keen to emphasise, whilst also ensuring that regulatory bodies are able to act where appropriate in the absence of an explicit patient safety issue. So, for example, where a registrant has engaged in behaviour which may undermine public confidence in the profession, such that it would make the public reluctant to seek their help, but the issue in itself was not related to their professional competence. The Bill also requires the regulators' panels and committees dealing with fitness to practice issues to have regard to the objectives. So, In practice, this should help regulators respond more effectively in fitness to practice cases by being able to take timely and robust action. And This, in turn, will help contribute to ensuring ongoing public confidence in the professional regulatory system. The EH has confirmed, based on their discussions with the organisations, that the Professional Standards Authority and the regulators affected are content with the regulatory provisions in the Bill. However, the position of these bodies is that the Bill in itself does not go far enough, as the Legislative Framework needs more significant reform through a Government Bill taking forward Law Commission recommendations. As you will be aware, the Law Commission published its review of the regulation of healthcare professionals in April 2014, and a copy was laid before the Northern Ireland Assembly. The aim of that work was to make recommendations for a clear, modern and effective legal framework for now and for the future. In fact, the regulatory provisions in this private member's bill are derived from one of the Law Commission's recommendations. DH and the devolved administrations agree that a bill is needed to achieve the reforms set out by the Law Commission and remain committed to taking forward that legislation when parliamentary time allows. This will be done on a four-country basis and the Department here will be kept fully involved in that process and will update the committee in due course as that develops. With regard to the Pharmaceutical Society of Northern Ireland, DH identified issues when applying the public protection objective measure to the society. And these difficulties emanate from the dual role of the society, as it is currently both the regulator and the professional leadership organisation for the pharmacy profession. The society's current objects set out in the 1976 Pharmacy Order are more reflective of a leadership and a membership organisation rather than focused on public protection. Therefore, introduction of this new proposed public protection objective would represent a fundamental change to the objectives of the society. So, as a consequence, Minister Wells wrote to his counterpart in England back on the 13th of October this year, confirming his agreement that this private member's bill was not the appropriate vehicle to implement such a change to the arrangements for regulation for the pharmacy profession in Northern Ireland. The Pharmaceutical Society has not raised any objections regarding its exclusion from the bill. The Minister also stated in his letter that such a fundamental change to the Society's objectives would merit careful local consideration and consultation with stakeholders. And this development is in fact consistent with previous considerations regarding the difficulties presented by the dual role of the Society. For example, in April 2014, the Law Commission reported in its review that it was concerned that by retaining its dual role, the Society has adopted a fundamentally different approach to healthcare professional regulation from the rest of the UK. And we share the view of the Law, Society, the Law Commission that the Society's role is fundamentally different to that of the other UK healthcare professional regulators, which is based on independence from the profession that they regulate. The Law Commission's review concluded that the Society should not be incorporated into the proposed legislative scheme unless its representational role is removed. In addition, former Minister Poots, during an Assembly debate in January 2012 regarding changes introduced at that time to modernise the Society, noted that the Society had developed a partial separation of their regulatory and professional leadership functions, but that he wished to follow up with the Society how full separation could be achieved in the interest of both the public and the profession. So the emergence of this private member's bill 
has once again brought this issue to the fore. So Minister Wells has agreed in recent weeks that officials should begin preparatory work to explore options for the future arrangements for the regulation of the pharmacy profession in Northern Ireland, and this will include consideration of the existing professional leadership role of the society. And this exercise is aimed at providing assurance in respect of arrangements for public protection, maintaining public confidence and upholding standards in the professional regulatory system. The Department has written <coughs> to senior officials within the Society to outline the intention to undertake this options analysis and to ensure they are included at the outset. And this project will of course include and involve full consultation and engagement with relevant stakeholders both locally and nationally, and we will be happy to brief the committee further as this work develops. In relation to the private members bill, the committee should also note that in addition to the Pharmaceutical Society, uh, the bill will also not introduce the public protection objective for the General Medical Council, as this is being done on a four-country basis through a different ongoing legislative vehicle. In terms of process, as the regulation of healthcare professionals is a devolved matter in Northern Ireland, executive approval has been sought for the legislative consent motion. We have also carried out an equality impact screening exercise of the provisions extending to Northern Ireland, and no adverse impact has been identified in relation to any of the Section 75 categories. In terms of consultation, as I said earlier, the regulation measure contained in the Private Members' Bill is in fact derived from a key recommendation made by the Law Commission in its review. And the Law Commission consulted widely when developing its report and findings, including contacting over 100 organisations in Northern Ireland. Furthermore, DH England has been engaged directly with the regulators regarding work arising from the Law Commission's review on behalf of the UK Government Departments through a series of meetings beginning in February this year, and this has included ongoing engagement on the Private Members Bill. Departments from each of the devolved administrations have also been kept involved throughout. And in particular, we have also engaged directly with the Pharmaceutical Society of Northern Ireland because of its particular circumstances. So, in conclusion, Chair, the Department supports the Bill as it relates to the regulation of healthcare professionals. We believe it is important that these provisions extend to Northern Ireland to ensure that we retain parity with the rest of the UK in this regard, so that the public in Northern Ireland can be assured that they are safeguarded in the same way and afforded the same protections as other UK citizens. And maintaining consistency in this way also ensures professional registrants are treated equally across the UK and that there are no variances in the regulatory requirements or processes to which they are subject or indeed potential obstacles to their mobility. So thank you again for this opportunity to discuss the proposed provisions with you. We are happy to receive any comments and questions that the committee may have. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, just a couple of comments. Probably just for clarity in the first instance, the, the, the PMB is it currently is defined, you referred to that being taken directly from some of the Law Commission's recommendations, is that? The, the regulatory provisions in the primary and the private members bill are directly derived from the Law Commission report, that's right. Okay. And it's an early opportunity, Chair, to implement those recommendations. Okay. And the, the other issue, I suppose, is the fact that both the Pharmaceutical Society and the General Medical Council. Um, I mean, there is a view that this well is not the appropriate vehicle. Yes. Them, but there, there's been no objections no, no. raised. The General Medical Council, actually, the, the same provisions are being introduced through a slightly different mechanism. Another legislative vehicle is, is already being progressed in relation to GMC, in relation to the Pharmaceutical Society, because their objects and the way they are established is set up in a <coughs> fundamentally different way. A private member's bill is not the appropriate vehicle to take forward um, the, the objectives for that, and it needs a further, more detailed consideration about the duality of their role. And, and is their work been developed around that, or is it that, that work has just begun? Yes, indeed, Chair. Um, I, I have been in touch with the Pharmaceutical Society for some weeks now around how we progress and research the options that are available to modernise and strengthen and ensure independence for regulation of pharmacists here in Northern Ireland. Um, the Society, um, as Heather has indicated, agree that they, the Private Members' Bill is not the vehicle in, in which to deliver that. So we will conduct 
a complete and comprehensive uh, options um, survey and, and appraisal so that we can um, consult widely with all stakeholders around the best mechanisms to ensure that strengthening of regulation for pharmacy professionals here in Northern Ireland. Okay, so that, that's very much a separate ongoing piece of work. Okay. Okay, then the, the, the other just question I had was in terms of time scale around this. Is there any indication <coughs> that the, the LCM would be laid before the Assembly or brought before the Assembly? Um, the Executive are due to consider it on the 20th of November, after which point it, it will be tabled. Before okay, thank you. Any other yeah, comments? Chair, thanks. Just for clarification, you mentioned the Law Commission. I presume that's the Law Commission here in Northern Ireland? It's the Law Commission of all four jurisdictions, so all of the Law Commissions um, were involved in, in relation to this review. Right, okay. And the Law Commission in Northern Ireland was very definitely involved. Yeah, had they been asked by the Department for the way forward in this? Is that what, or what, how was their involvement? How did the report, how did that, uh, yeah, yeah, was yeah. initiated? Well, yeah. the Law Commission is independent and they themselves can decide on their own programme. And so they, they weren't invited by the department to look at the regulation of healthcare professionals. Right. They have decided to, to undertake this work themselves. Right. And our own Law Commission was involved was in involved that? Was involved in that. Okay, that's fine. Thanks, Chair. Okay, I have Fergal and then... Just uh, one brief question. I can apologise for not being in at the start of your presentation, but thank you for it. Um, and how is the Pharmaceutical Society reacting to this? Well, as I said, the Pharmaceutical Society um, have been engaged uh, around, around this issue. Um, and they are, uh, number one, agreed that the private members' bill is not the me mechanism in which to, to change fundamentally the front page of the governing legislation for the society, which is the Pharmaceutical Order 1976. But that, um, and the, the, any change to this is a, a, a devolved matter. Um, but what we, we, we do is actively research the mechanisms available to us to bring forward um, modernisation of regulation for pharmacists in Northern Ireland. The, 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 the currently the only professionals not regulated on a, a health professionals regulated on a UK basis. And the other anomaly is, of course, the uh, idea that the society retains the professional representation as well as the regulator responsibility. Um, and it, it is probably perceived to be important that regulators are seen to be independent and impartial in regulation, and that's what we will seek to explore with, with the society. So okay. And will we be exploring this further, Chair, as time progresses? Yes, this yes. is just really an introductory. Can I leave that there, then, and maybe do some more work on this? Yeah, just, just to advise members at this point, I mean, obviously, when it's laid before the Assembly, it'll be referred back to committee then, and we would be expected to make a short report at that that point on it, so we will be coming back to it. Rosie? Gormayog and Carly. Um, Gormayog for the presentation. Uh, it's just a small point. Could I just ask you, looking at it in a different way, is there anything to be regretted by the fact that the Pharmaceutical Society isn't going to be included, just from your point of view? Um, we have taken some steps in the past number of years to ensure strengthening of the regulatory function of the society. Um, in 2011, we amended the pharmaceutical order to um, reform its council to ensure that there was appropriate parity between lay members and professional members on that council, to ensure that, that council had a responsibility to set standards for the delivery of pharmaceutical services, and also that its members were attendant to continuing professional development. We reconstituted its statutory committee and established a scrutiny committee. And we gave it a range of sanctions, from advice and warnings all the way through to, to, to striking off, so that it's um, a proportionate measures to, to, to ensure sanctions. So there has been effort in, put in place to, to ensure strengthening of regulation as things stand. Um, the uh, Professional Services Authority has audited the society and has expressed its satisfaction that those processes are working well in the public interest as things currently stand. Um, so we have modernised and we have made more responsive and we have strengthened regulation. Um, and I, I suppose the other issue that we need to now look at very carefully is this issue of independence and impartiality. So I'm just wondering, does that mean that you're content with the way things are or would you prefer they were included? So, so, so the 
the PSA who regulate the regulators have indicated to us through their processes that they are satisfied with how the, 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 the Council of the Society is <coughs> exercising its regulatory function in the public interest at, at present. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have no other comments at this point. Can I thank you all for your attendance and, and, and presentation on this today? Okay. Obviously, from a member's point of view, um, we will be returning to this as it develops. Um, so I'm just going to ask members at this point if we are generally content with the proposals, um, given that we will be returning to it. But I'm assuming from that, from what we've heard today, we're generally content. Okay, thank you. Folks. Thank you. Okay, members, the next item is the outcome of the June and October monitoring rounds. Um, page three of the tabled meeting folder for the relevant papers. And there's also page 32 of our meeting folder, which is correspondence from the Minister uh, providing clarity around answers provided by officials at the October modern round session on the 1st of October. I uh, want also to advise members that departmental officials are here today. Yes, they are. Um, uh, to outline how the department intends to spend the £20 million from the June monitoring round and the £60 million from the October monitoring round. Okay, folks, you're 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 very welcome, Richard. You're getting the baptism of fire discommodic in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Richard Pengelly, the permanent secretary from the department, and Joey Thompson, deputy secretary, resources and performance management. Both welcome. Um, I'm going to hand over to yourselves you. for the presentation. Then we'll open it up to you members. Thanks very much, Chair. Chair, I've only a, a few brief comments. I thought rather than taking up the committee's time with me talking, you'd probably want the opportunity to ask a few more questions. We just am um, obviously grateful for the opportunity to come along and brief the committee um, as regards the deployment of the £80 million uh, which has been made available to our department through both the June and October monitoring rounds. <clears throat> and as the Minister announced in his recent oral and written statements, given the scale of the financial challenge facing us this year, even this additional funding means there will still be consequences for the provision of health and social care services. Uh, put simply, it will just not be possible to maintain current levels of service in the absence of all the required funding. Uh, that amount was originally stated uh, in the region of £160 million. Uh, moving forward, the Minister has considered the range of competing pressures and priorities across the health and social care system, and at all times his clear focus has been to ensure that services are safe and effective while seeking to achieve financial balance. It is therefore decided that the £80 million additional allocation will be directed at providing a number of critical frontline services. We have outlined these in your briefing paper, but in summary, some £31 million will be provided to unscheduled care and patient flow, with the aim of reducing the number of breaches in emergency department waiting time standards, including particularly through the challenging winter period. It will also be used to invest in domiciliary care and to minimise the implications of trust contingency plan proposals in relation to locum and agency staff. There will be £14 million of investment in elective care. However, this is much less than the full extent of the pressure, and thus the current restrictions on the use of the independent sector will continue. In addition, elective care activity will focus on those urgent procedures which have been assessed and prioritised by clinicians. Support will be provided so that nice drugs and treatments are, can, can continue to be provided. Investments will be made in the Alton Galvin Radiotherapy Centre and to support the cath labs in Alton Galvin so that they can continue to provide a vital 24-7 service. Together, these specialist services will benefit by some £8 million. <coughs> Allocations of £8.5 million will be provided to a range of regional priorities. £8 million will be provided to support transforming your care. Four million will be made available to support increased nurse staffing levels to maintain safety and in acute wards. Three million will help meet some of the increased demand in children's services. Two million will be made available to resettle mental health and learning disability plans, and one and a half million will be allocated to support some vital public health initiatives. Alongside these additional investments, measures must be taken to contain, spend, and prioritise frontline services. In this context, the Trusts are in the process of implementing a range of contingency proposals. 
While a number of these proposals will cause concern in local areas, each trust has provided assurances that their services will remain safe with appropriate staffing levels in place. Such proposals, including the temporary closure of some minor injuries units, the closure of some beds and amalgamation of wards and outpatient clinics, will be implemented on the understanding that alternative arrangements are put in place to maintain safety and to mitigate the impact on patient flow. In parallel with this, other measures being taken forward by the Department include restraint over pay, although pay progression will continue to apply, and applying reductions to the spend of arm's length bodies, the Department's own administrative costs and pharmacy spend. Unfortunately, looking ahead, these financial challenges will continue in 2015-16, and we are currently assessing the impact of the draft budget, which was agreed by the Executive last week. So that's all I just wanted to say by way of introduction, Chair. So we're very happy to take questions from members. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, first, I suppose a, a number of direct questions. The, the statement uh, that the minister issued on the 30th of October referred to, and I quote, "Consultation processes will also commence shortly, which could mean that higher and lower clinical excellence awards will not be made." 2012, 13, and 20, uh, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. Is that a change? Um, change too. Well, we, we would all be aware of, of quite rightly, that the, the public reaction around the 34 million that was paid to senior consultants in terms of bonuses by dint of clinical excellence awards. Are we now saying that that's gone? And um, we're certainly going to consult on those awards not being paid for those two years in question. Um, so that that's the, the plan at the moment is to put that out to consultation which very shortly. And what what length of time would that consultation take, or is it standard twelve week? Um, it might need to be slightly shorter, uh, but it's um, you know it might be an eight week consultation. With all the detail of that yet to be worked through, but um, it certainly would mean that those awards would not be paid for twelve thirteen and thirteen fourteen if that was the, the result of the consultation process. So potentially those awards could be. Stopped mm -hmm. or not paid for the, for that period. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that cl that clarity on that. Um, the 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 other issue was in relation to the pay, um, and I, I noted as well from the minister's statement um, that he and again quoting decided to follow the lead of the finance minister uh, mm -hmm. and exercise a degree of restraint over pay given the financial challenges. And the need to prioritise frontline provision. Mm -hmm. um, staff will receive either the incremental um, progression that they are entitled to, or one percent consolidated pay award if they are at the top of the pay scale. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose I am asking specifically definition of top of the pay, pay scale uh, and how that would maybe tally with the protection of, of frontline services and, and I suppose low pay. Um, how that challenges, and was there any consultation in terms of agenda for change? You know, I, I mean, did the department consult, for example, with nurses um, um, before that well, decision not to award the one percent? I mean, I don't think there's a normal consultation process in pay awards. The agenda for change mm -hmm. was the subject of much dialogue before its implementation. The pay progression that's referred to in the minister's statement is uh, the entitlement to pay progression through the agenda for change pay position. Um, I mean, I think, to be honest, a better way of the one percent is really um, one percent for people who aren't entitled to pay progression, um, as opposed to people just at the top of scales. Um, as I say, we're still working through the detail because the decision has been taken so recently. But the intention is that it will. Um, and also, just to clarify, um, for people whose pay progression would amount to some less than one percent. I think we'll be looking at making that up to one, so everyone gets a minimum of a one percent pay award. But just just to be clear, then, Richard, now I'm coming back to this, um, and I, I'm just using my own notes here. But the statement had clearly said um, the one percent pay award if they are at the top of the pay scale. Yeah, each each. I think that would need to be clarified if if. if each pay scale. There's obviously a, a running uh, pay scale for each band, mm -hmm. and. Um, if you happen to be at the, the top of that pay scale for your particular band, then uh, rather than experiencing no uplift because you wouldn't be entitled to an incremental uplift, 
the intention would give to be to give a one percent, and if, for example, you were only to get um, something that only worked out at half a percent of of an uplift through in incremental, you would get the balance made up to a minimum of that one percent. So each each pay band has the top of a pay scale, and you will get to the top of that pay scale as your incremental entitlement. That's part of a gender change, and this does not change that the contractual entitlements are still in place. Um, you get a one percent if you happen to be the top of that pay band, and therefore not entitled to any incremental uplift. You will get a one percent instead. Well, I think I, I think it'd be useful to clarify that, um, Richard, because it does specifically say if they are at the sure. top of the pay scale. If we're saying not entitled to the incremental increase, yep. then let's clarify that. Sure. Uh, I think is the point as well. I think that, but that's more a, just a reflection of the speed at which we are operating here, rather than any intent to. Um, confuse people. Okay, okay. And the, the 31 million that was referred to in the statement for unscheduled care. Have we any indication of how that will be spent? I mean, there's there's a range of issues in that. It's um, keeping flow in uh, emergency departments, addressing some winter pressures. Uh, there's out of hours issues. There's also uh, domiciliary care in it and. I mean, the single most significant component of it is uh, the trust contingency plans originally included some quite um, significant reduction in the use of the agency and local staff, which would have a significant impact. So it was really providing funds to mitigate the need for uh, withdrawing a lot of uh, agency and local staff, and that, that would be the single biggest component of the £31 million. It would be useful, again, Richard and Julie, to have that information shared with us. Okay, uh, specifically, because obviously there's a lot of important pieces of work within that on schedule mm -hmm. care sector. I'm thinking specifically of of the trust contingency plans and the GP out of hours mm -hmm. work. So if we could have that breakdown, it would be important. Which which uh, leads me on nicely to the issue of the reference in the paper, obviously about defending um, or spending money rather on frontline services mm -hmm. and. The, the current issues, um, Richard, with relation to the direction that the trusts um, are, are, are heading in, if you like, mm -hmm. um, how can the department give us any indication, or can the department give us any indication of the direction <coughs> that it gives within the governance structures, but the direction that it gives to trusts in relation to how it protects frontline services. And I'm using the example, and I'm not going to make any apologies for it, of the situation in Dalriada, because it is a regional service, it's not a sure. constituency based service. So how can the department assure sure. us and the wider public that while it's saying it wants to protect frontline services, it can exercise <laughs> that authority on trust to ensure that less impact on frontline services are protected? Okay. I think, to be honest, Chair, this particular point would, is probably of more significance and relevance in terms of the discussions that we will continue to have in 15, 16 and beyond, where the nature of looking at 15, 16 and beyond is there are many, many more options to, open to us. I, and as a point of principle, uh, the Minister is absolutely explicit with us and we are explicit within the system. Frontline services must be given priority over administrative functions. There is absolutely no question about that. But the, the point in terms of the current financial year is we are seven months into the financial year. Um, this year, in terms of achieving financial balance whilst protecting the safety and quality of services, we have to go to those areas where we have some flexibility to reduce spend. Uh, I mean, the, the simple point is that the vast majority of the likes of administrative functions are provided by staff who are in normal uh, employment contracts. It is simply not possible to avoid that spend for the remainder of this year. So we have to look at areas where there is more discretionary spend. Now, that is why the measures in the trust contingency plans at this stage are temporary, and the Minister has been explicit that if they are to be made any more permanent, there must be full consultation in those. But in terms of achieving what we need to achieve this year, we are doing what we can do. Um, you know, with still a heavy eye on prioritisation and doing uh, those measures which have least impact. But 
it, it's a different position because we will have many more options open to us when we come to consider 15, 16 and the years beyond that in terms of the approach we can take. But the core of your point is, in every discussion we have with the board and with the trusts, um, we are about protecting. The, the front line is why we are here. The administrative capacity only exists to support the front line. And I think in terms of adding to that, um, the primacy, therefore, is the safety of those services on the front line. <clears throat> and some of the, the changes are really about ensuring that that is um, made to be the case and kept to be the case. Um, so it's about consolidating staff um, and ensuring that they're all used to full effectiveness um, and that where services do potentially need to, uh, on a temporary basis, be provided in a different way. So in the Dal Riyadh instance, um, the provision of those services in alternative areas or alternative places um, would be part of the proposal. That will still um, save the trust um, monies, which it can then bring the staff back into the likes of Causeway and into the, the likes of Antrim and allow effectively the, the saving to be made. But the primacy in all those conversations with the trust chief executives has been around safety of services and ensuring that that is, is and um, with kept, and also that they balance the books at the same time. Those are the two um, key tenets of the decisions. But just, just to sort of query that a bit further, then, can the department honestly say that, in the direction the department's going in terms of protection of frontline services, that the trust's decision to close this facility in terms of the regional service that it provides? Is in line with current policy. The, the policy is to protect the front line, and I think, just if we're dealing with the point of detail, um, the trust is not closing the service. The service will still be available to patients. The trust is proposing to change the way it delivers that service, and I think it is a, an important distinction, Chair. Well, I, I, I'm reluctant to get under the detail around, but that is not the view of the wider public there in terms of even the here and now. Mm -hmm. And issues around that, but I, I really I will pick up on sure. that after the meeting with you, Richard, if if, sure, sir. if, if, if you don't mind. Um, just one of the other things, and it's it's along a similar vein that I had was because I noted, Richard, you 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 talked about the here and now and the future direction of travel mm -hmm. in relation to spend. Is it envisaged, or is it within the department's remit that you could actually instruct? Or guide or advise trusts to complete full equality impact assessments on the decisions that they're taking. Trusts are in the process of completing. What they're doing is looking at the uh, quality screening of individual proposals um, and identifying whether quality impact assessments are necessary. So that's part of the process of them working down through all the uh, the proposals. Now that they still may need to. Um, temporarily close those services um, in order to maintain the safety and, and to break even and that, that is that is what work that is ongoing but they are certainly looking at equality screening and where necessary will imp will do equality impact assessments and equally as, as Richard has already said if there's any then change to do any anything on a permanent basis then obviously full consultation would also be part of, of uh, what they need to do but would the department have a role in ensuring that that would actually happen because we're all aware that there, there are different processes around screening in and screening out and full equality impact assessments. We, and we, given the fact that a lot of the, the proposals coming from all of the trusts that I can see currently read like an attack on frontline services. Certainly we have been in touch with all the trusts around ensuring that they are doing equality screening and all the gambit responsibilities within their own equality schemes, and we will keep in regular touch with them as they move through that. Um, but there won't be obviously a full uh, consultation unless the, those move to a permanent basis. So that's part of the, the, the monitoring like, that we're doing. I mean, the other point I would make on that point, Chair, is um, I mean I think we also need to recognise if if there's an obligation on the trusts to do something, um, the trusts have um, highly capable effective staff um, at a time when we're trying to reduce administrative burden and push money to the front line I, I personally don't feel it's the best use of our limited mm -hmm. resources if we ask the trust to do something and then the department immediately marks every piece of homework uh, and effectively reperforms the work they do no I'm not, I'm not suggesting that but I'm a su a suggesting in terms of accountability <coughs> governance mm -hmm. That if there's a statutory requirement on trust to fulfil 
equality impact assessments on some of these really difficult decisions that they are proposing, then that the department has an oversight mechanism there to make sure it happens. I'm not saying well, do the work for them. We, we have an oversight mechanism, which is we say to them on a regular basis, have you and are you discharging all your statutory obligations? The point I'm making is we do not every day visit every trust and take every statutory obligation and re-perform the work they should have done to make, to make sure it was done to a standard which we feel satisfies that obligation. So it is, it is very much a, a position of trust. They know what their obligations are and we ask them for fulfilling their obligations and they provide us with that assurance. But they're only now working through no, to be fair, they were, you know, they are, they have been working on this. Um, what I would say is that the closures potentially need to happen before all of that has been fully worked through. But um, they are working on it, and they know uh, to, to, to back up what, what Richard is saying. They know that that is part of their statutory responsibilities, and they're working in line with their equality scheme. So that's what they are currently working on. Absolutely. Okay. All right. A number of, of speakers here, members. Kieran first. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, three questions. Um, one is um, about the, the journey that we're on, the transforming your care. Does the Minister regard it as a strong means to the use of resources more effectively in the journey that we're on? And will there be more transparency around how resources are being transferred to support new interventions, for instance? The second question is, on the back of that, could, would you like to comment on the logic of the cutbacks on minor injuries unit when we are the transforming your care journey is um, to see um, the best use made of accident and emergency. We close the minor injuries units. Um, we're obviously going to put the pressure, more pressure on the accident and emergency. There doesn't seem to be any logic on that. Perhaps we should be seeking maybe to ensure that more people use the existing minor injuries unit to keep them away from accident and emergency. And the third question that I have is in relation to, and the Chair mentioned it, about the £31 million. I was disappointed that you weren't able to break that down into how you're going to use it. Perhaps we will hear that um, in, in the due course. But you do mention in the £31 million domiciliary care. Um, so that's more money going out to domiciliary care. Um, I, I can tell you, and you mentioned you've been in touch with your trust, that uh, in my trust, for instance, uh, they're going to re reduce domiciliary care. That's a con contradiction in terms, surely, and not in the best interest of the, of the community. The trust will now replace two out of every three domiciliary care packages. How can you square that circle? More money going into domiciliary care. My trust cutting it down. Is there other trusts the same, doing the same things? Okay, um, I, Apologies, but your first point in TYC, I'll, I'll, I'll say something, but come back to me if I don't fully address sure. the, the point you make. I mean, in terms of commitment, yes, mm -hmm. we're absolutely committed to that as a direction of travel. The, I think the point in transparency, we are committed to transparency, but I, I suspect there's a point of detail in there that maybe if you want to provide us with more information, are there some specific gap that you feel you but don't the, have a, a clear line of the, sight? The, and the, 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 there does seem to be a general a feeling that there is not sufficient transparency. I think it was it last week meeting that we had, and we went into this in depth, and there really didn't seem to be you people telling out the public, and particularly the committee, how you're using the funding. I mean, we had to squeeze it out of you, Julie, about how you spent how you spent uh, the, uh, the the 80 mil, some of the 83 million pound transforming care. We hadn't acknowledged that until you announced it last week, if you can recall. I think it was 13.8 for the 13-14 year. But you know, these are I things think we were from that session. I think we we're coming back to the committee with some further information. That's already gone to the committee and, and has been, well, as far as I'm, as yeah. I'm aware, has. And certainly, equally echoing Richard's point, if there are issues around transforming your care that um, you know we that you need more information on. Uh, we've certainly in our. Bidding information to yourselves, uh, giving you quite a bit of information about where the money would have been spent and how it would have been allocated and all of that. So there's a fair amount of, of work around that. We've, we've provided the information on 12, 13 and 13, 14 on shift left. I'm more than happy to um, provide anything else um, that, that the committee um, right. But it wishes. shouldn't be dragged out of you. You should no, be providing it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, the next one was on the logic of cut back. We don't always injuries. know what you want. Them. <laughs> You know, at, at times, I think we can be rightly accused of bombarding the committee with information and attempt to maybe hide things in the detail of it. So, I think it, it's a okay. difficult one to get the balance right. But we're very happy to, to provide more information that you want. Sure. Um, was minor injuries unit? The logic and closing minor injuries when we're trying to keep people away from I, I think, accident and emergency. Um, you know, it's incredibly difficult to take issue with what you say. But if I can refer you back to my comments to the chair, 
1415, we're dealing with a very difficult problem and a very limited uh, window of opportunity. So we're having to find areas where we can reduce expenditure. I would emphasise the temporary nature of the measures that are being taken for the remainder of this financial year. In terms of, you know, obviously we want to take people away from ED and towards minor injuries unit, but in this case, with the closure of the minor injury, minor injuries unit, and parallel with that, it'll, it'll free up some additional resources for EDs to deal with any additional. So it's a better way, um, financially, of deploying the limited resources. Um, it is not. Um, exactly where we want to be, and as we do our planning for 15, 16, and beyond. But you know, I can't emphasise enough: um, we can only spend money we have, and when that money runs out, we absolutely do not want to be in a situation where we cannot provide basic, safe, and effective services across the whole range of health and social care. So, these are very much the least worst options, not the best options. Well, I hear what you say, but I can tell you that. Um, as a member of this committee for quite some time, we had um, the minister, the author of Transforming Your Care, come to us on a regular basis and said Transforming Your Care was not about saving money, it was about doing things better and efficiently. But it seems to be that now where we're at, it is about saving money by cutting the minor injuries units away. Uh, you know. no, well, but I don't think that, that's necessarily internally logical, because if TYC isn't about saving money, well, if, you, if, if you're saying it now is about saving money, if we're in the middle of a financial crisis, surely we would be accelerating with all possible speed the direction of TYC. TYC is about a better quality provision of health care. This issue at the moment, and I can understand the, the point that it, it runs counter strategically, this is about living within the limited funds that are available to us for this financial year. And in that context, absolutely maintaining the integrity and quality of the whole range of health and social care provision in Northern Ireland. Um, the £31 million, pounds, I think the, the figure within after domiciliary care is £8 million. Um, I think the point is, on a separate issue, one of the very significant pressures, not necessarily entirely linked to, to the current financial position, is just the ongoing demand for domiciliary care pass it, um, packages and the growth in that. Um, the position the board are taking is to try and bring a greater degree of efficiency to that. So I think that's maybe where you're seeing the contradictory pressures that we're seeing where money's going in. What we're trying to do is lever every bit of value out of every pound that is spent on a package. So it's asking the question about for each and every package, is it the minimum package that is required to achieve the health outcome that we're aspiring to? Um, so I think you know, whilst you may see some individual packages, the pressure financially to squeeze them down. The more money going to mean that more packages will be available, albeit of a slightly lower individual value. And we would expect that at the end of the year that there will have been growth, absolutely, within the domiciliary care um, spend levels um, during the year, despite what is what is what is being proposed. Um, because, as Richard said, the growth in there is is, is significant. Um, it is again an area that can be looked at between now and the end of the year. Um, and it's 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 the same as the other proposals that. Um, if we had more money, absolutely, we could do more in this area. We could, uh, but unfortunately, we don't, and that's where we have to but, no. effectively make sure we live within the resources that we have as efficiently as we possibly can. You're getting eight million for domiciliary care, yet the people in my street that are going to be refused uh, domiciliary care packages. How am I going to explain that to you? You're getting another eight million pound from here to the end of March, isn't that correct? Yet you're cutting. You know, the eight million pounds effectively will go in to address a lot of ongoing pressures that are already there. The committee is well aware that the trusts have significant financial difficulties caused by um, significant pressures, um, and domiciliary care is one of those. So that money will go in to help to support and provide uh, those domiciliary care packages. But unfortunately, we can't do everything that we would want to do, and that's where the that's where the contingency plan proposals are effectively then cutting that cloth back a bit. So that's that's where the, the two do do match and, and that's the reality of where we are at the moment. Finally, Mr. Chair, I, I do agree with what you're saying but to, to a certain point, but um, how are we as public representatives going to answer to the people on our street that are being denied domiciliary care? We, at this moment in time, we are having to face that, that the, the community care people are going in. They don't have the time to do the work that, that's there to be done, and yet you're getting eight million extra with less work being done. That's a problem. 
Thanks, and I think Jill. it goes back to the point, because we're mindful that the trust will implement the trust decisions. Mm. But it goes back to the, the, the issue that the Department, in terms of governance and in terms of your now commitment to the protection of frontline services, which is very welcome, on paper very welcome, but how does that tally, or how can we ensure that that direction of travel is translated in terms of accountability and direction to the trusts? Because it is right to point that out, not only in domiciliary care, um, but the, 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 the proposals across quite a number of trusts, again, are at odds with the policy direction that we're hearing here. And that's the issue. I think, Chair, with, with all due respect, if we want to get into a debate about accountability, I think we're better having a session to discuss the accountability mechanisms, because I think if we take any individual item of care provision, we will find people who feel we're not doing enough, and that is the reality. But we're dealing with the finances available, so I think there's a risk that we can complete the accountability model with the quantity of care that is provided. There will always be people who are unhappy and not getting a domiciliary care package. That's not necessarily an accountability mechanism. That's either they, they individually don't meet the criteria. But accountability in terms of policy direction. In terms of accountability, I mean, the, the, the mechanisms are well in place in terms of between the department and each organisation um, across the whole gambit of services. So we have regular discussions about governance issues, about resourcing, about service delivery, about performance. There's a range of targets in place. All of those are, are monitored between the department and, and the trusts. Um, and, and in terms of where, where Richard's describing it, you know, we, we do that in the round. It's not that you pick any individual necessarily area and focus in the, only in on that. We focus across the whole matrix of performance and service delivery, along with financial performance, along with statutory duties around quality, for example, uh, and assuring they're, they're, do, they're meeting the requirements around quality 2020. When, when accountability is in play, which is on a, on a daily basis, it isn't just through uh, very formal mechanisms. It's about the department liaising with those trusts, but equally they have to do their jobs, their arm's length bodies with their own structures and they have to ensure that they are reporting through their own trust boards what they are doing and holding themselves, if you like, to account through their own trust board mechanisms and then back through to the department and to the minister. Um, but there's a, there's a complex a whole framework around that which isn't about individual areas per se, it's about the whole framework. No, except that and we are on. returning to this, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the committee are looking at the budget and going forward, and one of the pieces of work that we, that we had just raised previously before you coming into the meeting was the additional oversight mm -hmm. uh, mechanism that's been led by the head of the civil service. So, you know, we're, we're, we're very keen to see the workings out of that. Uh, Fergal, next. Oh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and given that this is about not just accountability but the finances, I think this is very thin. Four pages. £80 million, pounds, and I really couldn't walk out of this meeting having looked at what's on that graph and the uh, accompanying narrative that I know anything about how this £80 million pounds has been spent. Would you accept that? Well, I, I can't accept what you know or don't know. I mean, Sorry, from what I learned from this? Well, from what I learned from this is a sense of where the... I mean, I think also it's important to contextualise £80 million pounds and, you know, on a budget of £4.5 billion. Um, in terms would of you accept that, would you accept and I mean I think colleagues share this that just a, a line and thirty one million and a line and fourteen million is less than clear. In terms of the, 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 the background to that, uh, it all goes into um, the substantive uh, work we've done with the committee around, for example, the October monitoring bids. Each of those areas has been fully explained to the committee around what, what the needs are within each of those areas. And we had the two evidence sessions at the end of September and beginning of October around that. So um, um, the level of detail within this particular paper leans on the information that's already in play and already within the committee's uh, knowledge and the discussions we've had on an ongoing basis. Um, on 14-15. I think there's been at least three of those um, in, since the beginning of September. Yes, and this is, this is like yeah. the, the next bit of that. Please, of but, that. but of course the figures don't measure against the earlier narratives. And let's take, for example, uh, Transforming Your Care, uh, which is now getting £8 million. And you'll recall the conversation that we had when you said it felt like 14 or 15. Um, now it's 8. So mm -hmm. Could you explain to me what's going to be done with the eight? And specifically, what is the wage level for those who are carrying out 
the uh, transforming your care work within the department and is, does it form a, a major part of that £8 million? Pounds? In terms of um, the spend level, you're absolutely right. Um, the spend in 14-15 is likely to be of the order of um, somewhere 13-14 million. Um, in terms of that, um, we know, uh, and this is the same across the board, the 80 million does not does not give us everything that that we would need in order to meet the existing spend levels, and that's where things like pay restraint, for example, have to come in to take some of that back uh, and away. So. I can absolutely uh, agree with you that 13 or 14 million is what we expect to spend um, in 14-15 from this 80 million. Um, 8 million has been set aside against that. The rest of it will have to come within, from within um, internal resources, and the, the makeup or the balance, if you like, of how all of that uh, is bridged, is a combination of the measures that are that are then described in the latter part of the paper, such as the pay restraint, such as the arm's length bodies uh, cuts, such as the trust contingent mm -hmm. conferences. It's the matrix of all of those things that effectively brings you back to a spend level of 13 or 14 million, of which this finances eight of it from the 80 million. The, the question about salary levels? And with, yes, the question about mm -hmm. to what extent is that accommodating staff costs for the board or the department for the board in relation to TYC function? Uh, it, there's not a significant element. I mean, there's some support within the board in terms of um, you know, the management of the TYC programme, but the vast majority of it is um, initiative out in the ground, actually delivering care to patients. Um, you know, in terms, I, of, in terms I, of the you're clearly looking at figures there. That are breaking it down. Why are we not sure seeing these figures? I mean, I find this completely unsatisfactory. I have to say, in terms of, you know, we need to see a breakdown. I'm kind of having to second guess you, if you like, around figures that you've got there when we could be looking at them here and make this a much more effective evidence session. In terms of the um, service changes, um, for example, it's, it's back into the areas that we would have discussed with the committee in October monitoring around um, the atrial fibrillation no. and the stroke and, and things know, like but that. Now so you're, telling not me, you're, you're telling me, if you like, what I'm maybe picking a bit of. We should be seeing this in its entirety. I, I believe yes, no, I absolutely. I mean, it, no. it's that because I mean, I referenced it in relation to the 31 million for unscheduled care, and you know, in, in your response to me, you listed a number of key pieces and areas of work, but we don't have the detail. Yeah. We but have a, a head and, and an amount. That's right. But we we, yeah. we don't know who that's. I mean, it was only whenever Julie was pressed on, she gave us the figure of eight million for the domiciliary. She didn't give that figure to you, Chair. Yeah. In the absence of the figures, because I think we need to see them, Chair, and I would like, if, you, if, if formally we could request them, uh, can, uh, so I'll have to deal thematically now, because I'm not going to look over the hedge at your figures upside down, and, and you tell me something that you want me to hear, etc. So, um, how is the trust cutbacks that we've heard announced, how are they consistent with transforming your care and keeping care in the community closer to home? And dealing with people as close to home as possible. How are those cutbacks that have been announced, and I'll say unilaterally because they came as separate announcements, but mm -hmm. how is that consistent with transforming your care? As the point I, I've made, they're not always consistent with TYC because of the nature of the problem we face in this financial year. So don't we now have two conflicting strategies, if you like, if we could even call them that? Because one is no, sorry, this this is not a strategy. This, this is just protecting the front line. So this is an well, but that is what we need to do in this time. But this yep. is an operational issue to maintain the integrity of services and ensure we don't spend more money than we have available yeah, this year. It is not a strategic approach that either um, replaces or trumps TYC in any shape or form. But but doesn't it de facto? Because you haven't been able to demonstrate that it is consistent. And we see here how, for example, in Dalriada, and you know, we can go from the anecdotal to the factual, uh, but in reality, there's a facility there which is community focused, if you like. It's a step down element. Uh, it has a, you know, it's not the A and E or the very expensive hospital site. It has that local focus, and it's been cut. And I just don't see how it's consistent in any way with transforming, yet we are continuing to invest yeah. both in a strategy which is about restoring things to the community, trusts are doing their own thing, and you are saying they are protecting the front line. But, you know, in many ways, to use a, a very poor analogy, 
it's you know that period in your life where your, your car is coming to the end of its life and your negotiations with the dealer to buy a new car. At the same time, you do have an ongoing responsibility to get to work every day. And if you need to get a new set of spark plugs or something to keep your car going, that's the analogy you're in. You said that I haven't demonstrated that these contingency plans are consistent with TYC. I have specifically said they're not necessarily consistent, so it's, it's not, I hope, that I'm failing to do something I've set out to do. We, we are currently in November. Uh, for the, you know, the four and a half months left in this financial year, these are a set of temporary contingency measures that maintain the integrity of services, achieve financial balance. In parallel with that, and Julia is leading on a very extensive piece of work looking at planning for 15, 16 and beyond, which is very much, much guided by the strategic framework of transforming your care and taking that forward. It remains a key part of our aspiration for the way we design health and social care in Northern Ireland. But this is the here and now and the problem we have to deal with. Yes, and I hear what you're saying. But isn't there a danger that some of those trusts can cut back on the very facilities, including domiciliary care, including facilities like accident emergency, including, of all things, minor injuries clinics, which are about keeping, as Kieran says, people out of the expensive side of so not only is it and you're agreeing, it's not consistent. It's actually undermining. One is undermining the other. I don't think at the scale we're talking about. Well, because try and tell that to the people in White Abbey who are now going to go to uh, uh, um, the Royal or wherever else. And tell it to the people in Bangor who are now going to have to go to Dundonald. Yeah, and I, I'm and tell it to the people of Strangford who are going to have to go to Dundonald or elsewhere. I am not in any way trying to pretend that these contingency measures would have uncomfortable implications at an individual level. No, I'm talking I am here today talking strategically about manage of the health and social care system in Northern Ireland, delivering high quality care to 1.7 million people across the province. So the, but are the trusts the question I'm asking you, are the trusts acting consistently with that strategic focus? The trusts if they are cut, if they no, they are absolutely consistent and that they are developing contingency measures in a very difficult and challenging financial context to maintain the integrity and safety of the services they provide to the public. And, and, yet, and yet they can maintain that approach. And in my view, from what I see and from what we hear around the cutting of those particular services, they could undermine the other approach which we're investing well, scarce resources in. But is, is the easiest way for me to answer that? Would you prefer? Well, let me ask hypothetic, hypothetically: Would it be better to maintain a minor injuries unit open that was unsafe to the public, but was consistent with TYC? Because we're in the difficult place of having to make those sorts of choices, and safety and patient care must come first. Yes, but there's a balance going to come in this argument. Uh, it's a bit when the bike slows down, it'll fall up eventually. And we're at a point here, and I can appreciate the delicate nature of the way you're describing it, mm -hmm. you know, that we have to try to maintain two strategies. But one, in my view, and it's my view, but it's not something that I just bring to the meeting today. It's something we've consistently looked at and asking oh, throughout the year about the targets and the recommended measurables and the investment in TYC. And now we're seeing that trusts are um, cutting back on elements that would be consistent with that, but you say aren't consistent with frontline provision. Now, I think that leaves us with a big no, question. I'm saying they're not necessarily consistent with TYC, but they're absolutely consistent with the priority to protect the safety of frontline services. And that's the position we're but, in for four within, and a half months remaining in this financial year. Within that is the potential to undermine, and we have all agreed that we've seen value in the TYC objectives, the aims and objectives, about putting facilities in communities closer to people's homes, so that we don't end up going off. And it's the minister that keeps telling us this. I mean, the minister tells us every time we go in to an expense up the ladder, as he calls it, and that's more expensive for the system. And unless we confront it from that perspective, then we will end up with more expensive and greater demand increasing the cost. So it, there is the potential, at least you'd have to admit, that this is undermining the ambition of that. Absolutely not. I don't accept that. I would accept that if we had announced today a wide-ranging series of permanent measures that were counter-strategic to TYC. What we have announced in the, the overall context of the health service, and I absolutely accept, and I'm not trying to downplay the fact that the individual measures will have some 
potentially significant implications on individual patients across Northern Ireland. That's obviously a matter of deep regret. But these are short-term measures for a period of four and a half months. Anything longer than that will be subject to consideration with both public consultation and in the strategic context of the 1516 position. So they're short term. In the grand scheme of things, they're fairly limited. At best, at you, best you, they offer us a pause in terms of moving forward in TYC, but it's not a backward step. One more, yeah. one more point, because I haven't been able to get into the detail here. I felt forced into the wider narrative, uh, and I heard the interview with Valerie Watts, and I really didn't hear from her on the BBC in her interviews, and several interviews, sorry, that she did any assurance at all that some of these short-term measures wouldn't turn into long-term ones. I make that by way of comment. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Gordon, next. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for coming in. I think already you, you know, you've heard the tone of the meeting, and I think I would concur with the, the sentiments of the, the other members. And I think the important thing is we are elected representatives who represent our constituencies you know, and are very much aware of the issues. And, you know, I think um, the whole initial um, cuts, if you want, are, are, are rather drastic. I don't think they're very well thought out. And to me, you've picked the, the easy targets, the soft targets. When you look at the, the Del Riada situation and you look at, at Bangor, I'll talk about Bangor some bit later, but when you look at places like that, you're hitting frontline services. They're relatively low cost facilities. And I really do wonder what real savings are to be made if you look closely at, at them. And, and what we put it into perspective, I think it has to be put into perspective of the Belfast Trust, which I understand is about 20,000 people working for it. What savings are being made in the Belfast Trust? But it's probably a billion pounds spent every year. But those savings have been made on, on sites like that much easily and with less impact on, on the ordinary man and elderly person in the street. You know, has, has the trust really looked seriously at, at the implications for real people? It's, we're not just talking here. And, and we really do feel, and, and we've, I've had a talk, discussions with the Minister about it, we really do feel that the civil servants are driving this in, in a very sterile manner and, and in no real link with, with, with patients and with, with human beings, and I think it's most unfortunate, to be, to be frank with you. If you look at the Bangor Injuries Unit, and as one that been, has been elected in North Down for over 30 years, we fought hard in Bangor. In fact, the Ards here over there, we, there was a committee set up between Bangor and Ards Council 30 years ago to fight the very thing, and eventually we were left with two small hospitals. I think it's most unfortunate that, that the trust will now come along and, and undermine what we, we have left. Other areas like the west of the province thought the same changes, but in many cases got new builds. We never got a new build. Bangor never got a new build. Ours has never had a new build. We've had no investment by the health trust in those areas for years. And I find it unacceptable, the proposal to, to close what is the minor injuries, and it's totally, and it's already been said by my other colleagues from various parties, that it's totally contrary to transforming your care. To close the minor injuries in Bangor, it, it, we're trying, and we do everything as local representatives, representatives to encourage people to stay away from A&Es, and we're all aware of the pressures on the Ulster. And it brings me on to the other point, and I do feel strongly about it. How is the Ulster going to cope? The Ulster is struggling because of the changes of the city and the changes with the closure at the city hospital. The fact being that there's so many people are reluctant to go to the Royal Victoria for various reasons in Belfast, especially in South Belfast, East Belfast. So they're joining in with our constituents from Ards and North Down and South Down to, to go to the Ulster. And the facilities are not there. They're not there. And I must say I think it's unacceptable to close the minor injuries in Bangor and to put those, push them towards the Arts Hospital. And, uh, and in this last few days, I've had response from so many constituents in, in places like Bangor who, who said they have gone there and they've had a first class service. It's low cost, it's relatively low cost, and we know what it is. It's relatively low cost when you consider the budget of, of, of the trust or of the department. It's 4.5 billion you're working with, and you're going to close a few. And A and A, and you're going to close minor injuries, and, and the Dalry other thing, which I have no link with, but I think it's despicable to trust would even contemplate it. 
He's um, to respond, Dave, would you? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, Chair. I mean, I, whether you want me to, to speak mm -hmm. the committee listening to me repeat the series of points about the financial position we're in. Um, I mean, the, the specifics of uh, closing Bangor Minor Injuries Unit and the impact on the Ulster. Um, you know, of course, there will be some impact on the Ulster, but the question about has that been assessed? Yes, it's been excess, assessed by the senior management team in the Trust. I think that the, the closure of the Minor Injuries Unit will allow some redeployment of resources. So, whilst the facilities will change, the staff available uh, will be subject to some enhancement. Their professional view is that they can manage with this. But again, as I say, these are temporary measures to get us through to the end of the financial year. Richards, how long ago was it since ambulance were turned away from the NEA deals because they couldn't cope? Now, what assurance does that give to our constituents that the Ulster can cope coming into winter pressures? I'm sorry, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Well, I mean, I, I'm not disputing that point. The only thing I would say that since then there have been there's been a series of work focused on improving flows with NED. There's the, the work that uh, is headed by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Nursing Officer in terms of trying to secure improvements in the way ED has managed to prevent that, that sort of uh, issue arising again. But you know, I, I can't sit here and pretend that this isn't going to be difficult and there, there won't be potentially some adverse implications along the way, but we are managing an incredibly difficult position. But I think as well, and at the point goes back to the context and the policy direction and, and the variance with TYC, what we're hearing in terms of frontline services and decisions that are being taken at a different level within the delivery of health. That, that's, the, that's the challenge and the two do seem to be at odds. And I think the point's been well made today by, by a number of, of, of different speakers. And, and the other point that I would say to you, Richard, is you keep referring to, you know, these are temporary. Mm. Decisions. These are eleventh hour Seen decisions. It all before. The department told us in a recent evidence session that you knew the problems in the trust from August 2013. Well, the the, the problems were when the financial issue had been analysed. Um, pressures were presented in the June monitoring round. In previous years, we have been successful in monitoring rounds and securing resources. I think the one thing we would all absolutely agree on around this table is that a choice between implementing these contingency plans and securing additional resources from the executive so that we don't have to do that, we would obviously all prefer the latter. That was the strategy adopted. Those bids were tabled with a reasonable expectation of success, but the wider uh, macroeconomic Environment change, and the executive wasn't in a position to allocate the additional funding but, to the but department. But I think none of us are being naive enough to say that we're not aware of the difficulties and pressures within a number of departments, no less so in, in, in health. The difficulty becomes whenever we get a story like an additional 200 million to health, mm -hmm. which is good, but we wish mm -hmm. it was more. And I think we can all say that. But that's almost lost because we have a series of frontline proposed cuts across the trusts, which seem to be at, at odds with the very policy direction that we were all told was the great hope in terms of the future delivery of health. And I, 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 I'm going to finish it at that, because I think the point has been well made to you, and I have a number of people indicating still. Rosie? Uh, Gura Mayor, uh, Kahali. Um, just for the point of clarity, and I know the Chair raised this point at the beginning, uh, do you see in terms of nurses' pay, can mm -hmm. you say categorically that all nurses will get the 1% pay increase? Yes. They, they get either their incremental um, and contractual entitlement, or if they're, not, if they're at the top of their pay band and they won't uh, therefore be entitled to that incremental increase, they get the 1%. So they don't get both. If you're entitled to an incremental uh, uplift, which is more than 1%, you will just get that incremental uplift. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're at the top of the pay band and you don't have that incremental uplift, you will get a 1% instead. So it's, it's, it's either up to a max of 1%. And is, does that satisfy the commitment that they feel that they were given? In terms of agenda for change, um, the, the contractual commitment is to give those incremental uplifts, and those are absolutely being paid for. Paid. Yeah, but we are hearing from nurses about the one percent. I just want to be clear that they're they're going to not feel hard done by if 
if they're just getting an increment and they were expecting the increment plus the one percent, you, you're saying that they wouldn't be expecting that. I think um, the reality is they were hoping because they had a strong hope for that, and that goes back to the pay review body, pay review body report. Was that what the commitment that was given? That wasn't a commitment. That was a recommendation. Um, in England, they rejected the recommendation of the pay review body. In Wales, they rejected the recommendation. They implemented it in Scotland. And the position here is that um, one step progression is applying, but not one, the one percent on top of progression. But it's basically providing for a minimum one percent increase for staff. Okay, I'm just trying to work out then if nursing staff who aren't at the top of their scale and who receive an increment which they would have been entitled to anyway, they'll feel they didn't get any increase really. But the, and is that the way it's going to be left? As it is, but the, the point is, in the circumstances you outlined, the individual concerned will get a pay rise. His or her pay will increase as a consequence of the pay progression. Yes, I know. I'm just trying to work out if that is what they feel they were promised. That's all. Well, to be clear, I, I, I mean, obviously, I can't account for what they feel themselves. I would acknowledge there, there was certainly, I hope, that they would get both based on the pay review body, but it was only a recommendation to ministers. It was never a commitment by ministers to implement it, and different parts of the UK have responded differently to that. On, on the paper in general, I agree with Fargal that there, the information is so scant that it's hard to, it's hard really to, to, to know what to talk about because there's so little detail, and um, I don't find it helpful at all. In fact, at, at a previous committee I was on, officials were sent away because um, it was felt by the committee that the information it was going to be a waste of time, so they were sent away and then come back with fuller information, and I nearly feel that's what would have been better doing here today, but we are where we are, I suppose. Um, I'm concerned about um, transforming your car as well, about what, what it means, because it's always the people on the ground and it's the people who we meet on the streets who are going to be feeling the effects of any of the cuts whenever it all works its way down. And, you know, this big future that people were, were promised and was anticipated that they were going to receive this great car. And now it looks, it's all starting to crumble. I mean, I'm looking about the domiciliary car. I mean, people who, who have been working in that field for years were stretched to the limits. And now they're going to, probably going to be, people will be expected probably to work for nothing. Really. I imagine, because I know people who practically worked f for nothing in some cases who, who were working and weren't getting paid for it because the, I think people's emotions were used and have been used by the system. So, you know, somebody going in can't bear to leave a, a sick elderly person uh, and they're not getting paid for it, but they feel they have to do it. And I think there is, people are taking advantage of, you know, there is an advantage taken off very good nature of people who work in that field and it looks to me like it's going to be stretched even further and what would you say about that? I think I mean, it's the point that Julie made earlier that you know more money is going into domiciliary care but given the demand on it it's being stretched um, wider and wider across all the clans. <coughs> I mean, the last point you make, I mean, there, there are two points. In terms of the obligations on employers, you know, national minimum rate rate may, wage rates apply. There's obligations on employers to be sensible and sensitive employers. That said, you know, I absolutely um, get the point you're making about the sort of people that work in domiciliary care are hugely committed to providing high quality patient care. And I think on, on a daily basis, they step well across the line that they need to in terms of staying longer and doing more. And that, you know, I can easily see how that feels like unpaid labour. You know, there's obligations on the employer, but you know, in many ways we're dealing with a group of special people here who work in this sector and provide this care. I know, but I still feel it's such an unsatisfactory situation that almost the trusts rely on people going, you know, ten extra miles nearly. And I just think that's that's a very sad reflection that it's it's taken for granted. Can I just have a wee bit more detail, please, on the two point five percent for uh, reduction? Um, are awarded the arm's length. What is that? <coughs> applied to arm's length bodies? It cuts rather. Is that going to be 
across the board, or is that each individual arm's length body will be cut by 2.5%? It's each individual body. Each, body. Okay. each of the smaller bodies, that, that's basically um, the ones that, that are outside the trusts, effectively, um, have been asked to identify what 2.5% cuts to their budget, and every single one of those bodies um, will have to then live within that reduced uh, budget going forward. And who, has spec who specifies where the cuts will take place? They what, what, what element of work or service will, will feel that? They have each identified, um, again, similar to the trusts who have identified their contingency proposals, the arm's length bodies um, have identified where they believe they, they can most appropriately take out that 2.5%, again, in a manner that is achievable between now and the end of the year. Um, and they, they have, if you like, put those proposals forward and then will have to live within that lower reduced um, budget for the remainder of the year. So they would be telling you, like, this is where... Yes. You have that plan, like from those arms, arms length bodies. They've each had to, yes, advise us that they can live within the reduced budget and what the implications of that are. Yes. So, for instance, like the ambulance service, where would they be going to make the? Cuts? The ambulance service is viewed as the same as the trusts in that um, they have um, that this proposal on the two and a half percent affects um, the smaller arms length bodies, which are not the trusts. So the six trusts are, if you, if you like, set them aside. So this affects um, all the other smaller arms length bodies. The the um, NIPEC, NIMDA, um, Social Care Council, um, Fire Service, those bodies, as opposed to the trust bodies. So the trusts have looked at their, and are really have been the basis of the rest of the conversation that the committee has had. And this is them saying that the other bodies need to contribute in as well, and that they can't just live with the the full budgets that they already, that previously would have had, um, and that they need to, if you like, live within that reduced level in order to get the overall books to come back to balance. Okay, so in terms of the ambulance service, because we know that um, there have been huge difficulties, what, what sort of cuts will they be taking or how will they be impacted? Because I'm wondering where, where they go, because we know there's huge sickness levels, there's, there's massive staff reduction in staff morale, and so that all flags up internal problems that, that mean there's something else going on. I think, I think there's a number of issues within the ambulance service. In terms of the remainder of this year, there are no specific hard plans for the ambulance service to contribute to. Um, for the longer term, obviously, as we move forward and the financial position continues to tighten, I think the bigger challenges for the ambulance service are about um, recruiting, motivating and managing their workforce, rather than necessarily all being financially motivated. Um, it's about getting the right people in. As, as you mentioned, they have some problem with, with sick absence. They, they need to manage that uh, and need to work with their colleagues in terms of rules and coverage. I don't know if there's any other points the, Their issues tend to be more about managing the increasing demand that they've got within a budget, uh, you know, as opposed to taking money out. But are they being left to internally resolve their own issues, or is, the, is there I don't, in, in terms of 14-15, they don't have a, a, a problem that manifests itself here. We'll continue to work with them going forward. Um, they'll certainly you know, be working very closely with us in terms of the generality of the 15-16 financial position. In terms of specific support for issues they face, we of course you know, we have a sponsor division within the department that works very closely with them. We will support them in every way we can in terms of addressing those issues and maxing, uh, matching resources to demand properly. Thank you. Uh, Joanne. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I apologise for missing your briefing? And just as I came into the meeting, I just caught the, the end of your comments, Chair, so my question may already have been covered, and if it is, I look forward to reading the Hansart uh, and, and Richard's um, answers to it. It's around, um, again, the additional budget oversight by the head of the Civil, Ser Civil Service. I asked the Minister in the Chamber on Monday mm -hmm. uh, this specific question, and I didn't get a response. So if you could maybe tease this out a bit more, and it probably has, has been covered, but um, if you indulge me, um, could you give me your views, Richard, around this, uh, the impact you feel the additional budget oversight will have on the department, especially in relation to October monitoring round, but also future spending? And do you agree then with that additional oversight? Um, I'm afraid I can only talk conceptually because. The, the additional oversight that was announced by the Finance Minister is something that we have only very recently become aware of. It is not something that we have had any, material, or any dialogue at all with our colleagues in, in DFP 
or in the head of the civil services office as yet. So we, we await that dialogue. At a conceptual level, um, I don't have anything to worry about additional oversight. Um, I've been in the department since the 1st of July. The financial position, the way it's managed, you know, I have huge respect for you. Know, Julie leads in this. Julie has, does an absolutely fantastic job for us. I now work very closely with Julie. Um, I have nothing to fear. Um, you know, of course, I would say that, but I'm absolutely genuine. You know, um, the, the one concern I have is I have no difficulty at all with any amount of oversight or scrutiny of anything and everything we do. Um, so a complete open book policy where people can come in and look at what we do, how we do it. The worry I have is that if that oversight comes in and wants to spend a huge amount of time with myself and Julie, because then it becomes a distraction from us doing the job of managing the position to explaining to someone else how we manage the position. So happy to work with them, nothing to fear, but I hope it's, it's a light touch in terms of not taking us away from the, the onerous task we face. So are you saying you've just been made aware of this? And the, in, in terms of the, the announcement about the executive decision, okay. that, that was the... Um, and they, okay. Certainly if they had... Uh, Tried to negotiate it with us beforehand, we might have pushed back a bit. Joanne, can I just, if you don't mind, just yes. just just jump in on that? I mean, I I find this, that just incredible, Richard, because you know the DFP minister in the June monitoring round, in the previous monitoring round, but specifically in the June monitoring round, raised issues around concerns about mismanagement or management of the current health budget. It is something that I have been consistently raising, that this committee has been consistently raising, about where spend currently goes and the need for additional oversight within health. So to hear now the Permanent Secretary saying this is the first time that you are aware that the, I, 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 I have to say I find that hard well, to believe. Perhaps I could clarify, Chair. I didn't say that I hadn't heard the Finance Minister make those points. The question was the very specific point about oversight by the head of the civil service. My issue was the first I knew about that is when I was told about it. And there was no mention of it before that, so I think by definition but, I couldn't have known about it. Again, Richard, I mean I do find that difficult to to comprehend, I have to say, because people uh, across departments, across the system, across wider society were reflecting on the guidance, and you know, when the, any DFP minister gives guidance to a department, you sit up and listen. So whether the, the decision to implement it was new, or that you've only just become aware of, but I, I would have thought that, given the advice that was given, certainly in black and white on one occasion and reference on the earlier occasion, that at least conversations would have been taking place. But I think, Chair, either, either you or I are confused about what has happened here. There is nothing happening here that is a reflection that we haven't been doing something we should be doing. Um, we are in full compliance with all the DFP guidance in terms of monitoring around budget processes. This was, uh, I mean, the, the only conversation I've had, um, health, and we have to acknowledge this, uh, in terms of the draft budget position, is in a much better place than other departments in terms of the protection afforded to us in the £200 million you mentioned. Um, equally, uh, in the course of the in-year monitoring rounds, in June we received 20, in uh, October we received 60, much better than any other department. The understanding I have from very informal dialogue is that this is part of the consequence of us getting what is perceived by other departments, and there's many other departments are articulating huge concerns about their own financial position, that there's some additional burden being put on the department from the centre. So, it, it's, so as I say, my point is, uh, and it's simply a factual statement, if DFP and the head of the civil service want to put an additional burden on us, I can't know about that until they tell us about it. So my answer is, I knew about it very recently when I was told about it. We are absolutely in compliance. The point you make about the Finance Minister's comments in June, I think they were very much focused on his concerns about the financial management that led to the overspend in the 13-14 year. And I think uh, the then Minister was very clear in his analysis that that wasn't any form of financial mismanagement. Mm -hmm. it was a clear, conscious decision not to scale back services in such a way that would have rendered them unsafe or unfit for purpose. 
So okay. well, I I think apologies for jumping on, Joanne, no, but no, I, 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 I don't totally accept that, that time. Totally I totally agree with you. It does seem incredible that this is all sort of new to you. And I'm sort of taking a, a, a back, like, like the chair, with this. And so, have you been briefed then, Richard, and how the mechanism will work in practice? Are those details being discussed? No, as I said, I haven't had any dialogue. I'm not sure that the mechanism has been. I mean, I assume colleagues in TFP will be thinking how they want to do this, and then they will talk to us about it. But, um, but it's it's their process. It's not my process. So, um, is know, their process to take oversight of? Your, your, your role, but, so it, but the difference is, it's not management of our role. They're not replacing our role. They're not supplanting us in any way. Um, I, and you know, it's it's the way that I my reading of it, and this is a personal perspective mm -hmm. on it. It's their way of providing assurance to all the other departments who are perhaps a bit frustrated about the level of investment in the health service, an investment that I personally feel is absolutely warranted. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they're. That's probably thinking. why the minister wasn't able to answer on Monday when I raised that with him in the chamber, because of you only mm -hmm. hearing a, a, a about it as well. So you've no detail the mechanism for it. Then, is it also correct then that an independent, longer-term strategic re review is also set to be ordered? Are you aware of that, or is this correct? I'm, from I'm aware of it. That it's there, but I, I don't know the detail of it or what it will do or how it will do it. And we have we have sought sorry Joanne just for your own information, we did raise that I raised Previously. that initially at the start okay. under chair's business to seek clarification on those two issues. So okay. that will be coming back in writing that we can reflect mm -hmm. on that then. Okay. I was going to ask about domiciliary care, but I think everyone seems like that's a big big concern. The, the point I, I would only make chair on that point in terms of seeking clarification, bros, it wasn't an announcement by my minister. It, the announcement was made by other ministers and so you know, it's not unreasonable that my minister doesn't know the full detail of something another minister has announced. Oh, okay, but uh, well, just to clarify, we are writing to DFP. Sure, sorry. Um, to, to, to get that that advice, but again, Richard, without opening up all of that issue, um, you know, the, the, there was a very clear commentary around the the health budget spend, uh, which wasn't something that came out of the blue, and in, in my view, has certainly been very apparent from June, if not before it. So I'll, I'll just close it at that. But uh, my analysis of, this, of the situation will be slightly, slightly different. I have George. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Joanne. <coughs> thanks, Chair. And uh, thanks to the team as well for the presentation. Um, a few months ago, with the situation where so many care homes in Northern Ireland were, yep. right, all, all our constituencies were to be closed and so forth. And, um, are we? Because of the, <clears throat> the budgetary constraints and so forth that we're, we're all suffering from at the present time, uh, are we back to one of those situations again? And the other, other point I wanted to make was uh, the Alton Galvin situation, the new cancer unit. Is there any danger that that could be suspended? You know, the new building and so forth could, could be suspended, or is that still on stream? And the third point would be. <clears throat> regarding the nurses, mm -hmm. uh, the increase for them, when, when do you envisage that taking place? Um, the, 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 sorry, the, the last point is the generality of the pay rise? Yes, when, when. Talk, talk, okay. That would be in um, their pay packets, basically. Okay. Uh, the, the first point, is, in terms of the, the care homes, um, I, I hope you'll forgive me that um, when that issue broke, I wasn't here, so I don't have the memory of it. That, that others will have, but what I would say at the moment is the issues we're talking about. And apologies for sounding like a broken record; they are temporary. Any permanency alongside them will be subject to consultation and uh, consideration in the strategic points that, uh, particularly, Mr. McKinney made. Um, so I, I don't know how that resonates with what happened in, in the past. Julie may want to come in and say something. The nurses' pay rise. Um, now, that's just an administrative process. It's now, working through processes um, in terms of approvals with DFP and the like. So that's a, it's an ongoing process which we'll conclude as very quickly as possible we can. Yeah. 
And again, Alt McGelvin, um, the cancer. Alt McGelvin money will, as uh, uh, I think Minister already confirmed, both in a statement and to the, and to the committee, um, the monies that are needed in 1415 to keep that moving in the right direction. And the radiotherapy centre will be provided in 1415, um, and um, that's that's where we currently are. Obviously, as Richard says, we need to look then into 1516 and 1617 mm -hmm. and whatever. But there, the money has been made available in 1415 that it needed in order to keep that position moving forward. And on the capital side, the money there is also available to, to keep the build going as well. So it's all still moving uh, full ahead. So there, sh there should be no delay then? There's no delay in current plans. Provision. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, George, for that. Okay. Uh, I mean, I suppose a couple of things, um, some smaller than others, but I think the, the, the members have indicated clearly that there's a level of concern that what is being proposed throughout the various trust areas is somehow at variance with the policy direction around transforming your care and the protection of, I suppose, focus on prevention, early intervention, primary and community care. Um, and that's at odds with what we're hearing in relation to the budgetary commitments. Uh, and I think that that's something that this committee um, we'll, we'll be very active on and be very, very mindful of in terms of the policy direction. I think it is proper that we get the full written breakdown uh, of the £80 million that's proposed today because um, it's not appropriate that we don't have those costs. We have loose headings, um, but we don't have the, the, the breakdown. So I would appreciate it. Richard and Julie, if that could be supplied to the committee in writing as soon as practically possible. We'll, we'll obviously need to take that request to the minister, Chair, which we will do when we get back to the office. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for your time today, folks. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on is the food hygiene rating bill um, proposals for handling the committee stage of this. Um, just advising members that the bill was introduced to the Assembly on the 3rd of November. The second stage is scheduled to take place on the 12th of November. If the bill then passes second stage, it will be referred to the committee here for committee stage. I um, just want to inform members that a briefing paper outlining the proposed handling arrangements for the committee stage is at page 12 of the tabled meeting folder. Um, again, advising members that a draft signpost and media notice a list of key stakeholders from which written evidence will be invited, the delegated powers memorandum and a draft timetable for the bill is included in, in uh, that, that uh, paper. The stakeholder list includes the organisations that responded to the Food Standards Hi Agency on proposals for statutory food hygiene rating scheme. Uh, again, just advising members that generally four weeks would be allowed for the submission of written evidence. Um, so it's proposed to have a closing date for a receipt of written evidence for the 12th of December 2014. Um, so I'm asking members first of all to agree the closing date for written evidence will be Friday the 12th of December 2014. Members agreed. Agreed. I'm also asking members for agreement to uh, to agree the draft media sign post and notice and the list of key stakeholders. Agreed. 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 Thank you. And to agree that the written submissions are published on the committee webpage. Agreed. And to agree that the delegated powers memorandum is sent to the, ex the Assembly Examiner of Statutory Rules. Agreed. Agreed. And to agree that an oral evidence session with the Food Standards Agency is arranged for the 26th of November 2014, and that an oral evidence session is arranged with the Chief Environmental Health Officers Group or the 14th of January 2015. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I'm asking members then to note the bill timetable. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item is an SL1. It's a proposed amendments to the Safeguarding Board. Uh, refer members to page 31 of your tabled meeting folder for the relevant papers. Uh, again, advise the members of the department had submitted a revised SL1 to amend the Safeguarding Board regulations, which make provision concerning the membership, procedure, functions and committees of the Safeguarding Board. 
The revised SL1 is based on option 3, which the committee considered at our meeting on the 15th of October. Uh, advising members that the Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to amend the quorum requirements so that in exceptional circumstances where more than one third of members declare an interest in the proceedings, the quorum requirement will be met when at least two thirds of the remaining members Great. present. Um, I am informing members that the Department's expectation that the existing quorum requirement of two thirds will be met at most meetings of the Safeguarding Board, assisted by the introduction of deputisation, the quorum formula, which will apply in exceptional circumstances only, uh, will only require good attendance by board members to make it work in practice, which is again facilitated by the introduction of deputisation. And in addition, the regulations would allow for a designated doctor to be appointed to the Safeguarding Board. Um, so today, members, I mean, members will remember th that there was a vote uh, taken at last week's committee on the effective delivery mechanism for the Safeguarding Board, uh, which uh, was not passed. The, um, but I am advising members today that the committee has to come to a decision on whether or not it is content with the proposed statutory rule. So I am asking members for their views on the proposed statutory rule. I so propose that we accept this proposal before us today for the Safeguarding Board. Second. Very well, yep. Chair, um, last night um, all members of this committee, and including a lot of other members of the overall assembly, sat at a very important debate, uh, uh, at the centre of which was the issue of sexual abuse. And Central to that debate was the issue of transparency and accountability. Um, we are being asked, and I made this point at the last meeting, to reduce a threshold around some of the levels of transparency and accountability. Uh, uh, sorry, to reduce the decision making process. And for me uh, and the SDLP, the, the issue of, um, of reducing that um, at, to a deputisation level and reducing it will have implications for public perception of the outcome of that report. Um, I think I, I, I draw the connection between last night just to, re, to emphasise the fact that it's important that these, these issues are uh, uh, the perception of the public mind uh, uh, it should be at the, high, at the higher level of all of this. And that um, my worry is that it dilutes it and the public perception will be similarly diluted. So I would object. Okay. Do you want to make a formal proposal in that regard? Uh, yes, I propose. Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know there was one on the front. Is there any other comments in relation to this? I think, Chair, just to, I would like to say, following on from Fergal, you know, we, we listen to the evidence and I think we are confident that the, the professional recommendation that before us is right. If it wasn't right, I wouldn't do it. And I wouldn't be standing over it. And I would like to put on record, as it says here, that this will provide for a larger pool from which to draw attendees at the SBMA meetings and at the same time maintain the original policy intention of achieving senior representation at board meetings. But, but, I think that's important. Yeah. You know, any uh, attendees at these board meetings will be at the highest level within their organisations. We have given, got an assurance that they are competent, capable, professional people, and that will, will continue. And, 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 Chair, it informed the debate at the time of the setting up of the SBNA board that they wanted the most senior individuals available to give it the maximum strength. This dilutes that. And, and I think, and again, I just, just to add my comments because my views are known and well known on this issue. Um, but the, the, the issue that has come to the fore around this discussion in, in terms of being the Safeguarding Board being the effective vehicle for this thematic review, and that is no, again, no judgment or, or, or slant on the, the very vital work that they do to date and continue to do, but the issues around all of the ones that have come to head in terms of conflict of interest, in terms of ongoing prosecutions of over 18s, access to cases will remain 
in my view, will remain in, in whatever the quorum is reduced to. And that is the issue in terms of getting the right response to this. I think Rosie had you indicated. Yeah, I mean, I have concerns, even that the Safeguarding Board is, is the body which should take forward that review. I think that, you know, there's been, as you say there, I mean, it's the ability to, to take forward those cases. And uh, I just have to find it like that completely. Okay. Well, look. I mean, let let's just be clear here. There, there is, there was a proposal on the table last week around the safeguard board being the, the effective vehicle, not the effective vehicle, to deliver on the thematic review. That vote was not carried. I'm asking Gordon. Have you got a proposal? To the committee now. Well, I, I would have already had, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I just ask what, what exactly? Could you outline the proposal again for me yeah. then? Yes, yeah, we, we support the, the proposal, proposed amendment to the Safeguard and Board Northern Ireland Membership Procedure Functions and Committee Regulation 2012. So that the, the committee, I mean, it, it, uh, am I right in saying what I'm hearing? That what you're saying, Gordon, is that the committee is content with the department. We're trying to get this right. With the department's um, proposal to yeah. make the statutory rule. Yeah, as signed off by the Director of Family and Children's Policy, Elise McDaniel. We're supporting the professional recommendation. We're supporting I the proposal. That, I don't think that has been. But, you're, but just to be clear, can I reiterate, for, because if this goes to a vote, I want to be clear on what it is that's been proposed. Uh, I'm not sure the status of the SL1 being signed off. What we are asking here. Is, is there a proposal to proceed that the committee is content to proceed with the department to make the statutory rule? Yeah, great. Okay, yeah. is that that's your proposal? Yeah. You want to put that formally? You yes. put that formally. I thought I've done that. Okay. At least twice. And there's but there's a conflicting view, Gordon, with respect on this. Well, they will need to vote against them. So can we? Do we want to vote on this then? Is that what people are saying? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So. All those in favour of the proposal that the department is content, that the committee is content with the department's proposal to make the statutory rule. A bit of a show of hands. Okay. All those against. Okay. So it's carried. Thank you. Okay, members, the next item I have today is the review of the Department's Benefits Management Framework uh, for Transforming Your Care, the appointment of the expert advisor. Uh, I'm seeking agreement to bring item 13 forward on the agenda. Just bear with me here. Yes. Uh, refer members to pa uh, page 95 of the tabled papers um, on your meeting folder. I'm just reminding members that it was agreed at a meeting on the 1st of October that a subgroup comprising the chairperson and the deputy chairperson, as has been procedured with other committees, would select the expert advisor to assist the committee in scrutinising the department's benefits management approach to transforming your care. I'm advising members again that myself and the deputy chairperson have selected Anne Watts, who is the Managing Director of the Change Emporium Limited, as the expert advisor. Just for members' information, the Change Emporium was founded by Anne Watts no. following a career in the programme project change management field, which spanned a period of 25 years across both public and private sectors. Her expertise includes organisational development and strategy. Uh, benefits realisation management, change leadership and management, and business transformation. Where is this on the agenda? Sir? That's on page 96. Page 96. 13 on your table, the agenda. Right, thank you. Okay. And so I'm asking members to ratify that decision unless there's any other issues, comments. Great. Okay. Uh, members, item nine is the forward work programme. It's at page 28 of the meeting folder. Uh, again, advising members that in addition to the items on the work programme, an evidence session has been scheduled with Professor Kathleen Marshall and officials for the 19th of November on her report into child sexual exploitation, which is expected to be published by then. Uh, advising members also that an evidence session with 
departmental officials on the draft budget for 15-16 has been scheduled for the 26th of November. Um, so they're just added on to your forward work programme. Um, the next item is matters arising. There's four ma items under matters arising on the meetings folder and eight items in the tabled meetings folder. So again, in terms of time, I'm going to raise oh, attention to a number of them unless uh, members have others. Page 50 of your tabled meeting folder is a response from the Department regarding suicide prevention and bereavement support. I'm seeking agreement to forward the response to the Family Voices Forum, who had raised the issues with us. Great. 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 Uh, page 53 in the tabled folder is a response from the Department regarding progress on, on an annual cancer patient experience survey and related data protection issues. Again, I'm seeking agreement just to forward this to pancreatic cancer, who Great. had raised the Great. issues. Great. Um, page 55 in the tabled folder is a response from the department regarding the Choose Well campaign. Um, seeking agreement to res forward the response to the mental health rights group who raised the issue with us. Great. Great. Uh, page 57 again in the tabled folder is a response from the Department of Education in relation to child visual impairment statistics, vision strategy, and the review of habilitation services. Again, I'm seeking agreement to forward this response to Guide Dogs NI, who had raised the issues. And page 61, again in the tabled folder, is a response from the Department of Justice in relation to the PSNI powers to seize legal highs from young people. I'm seeking agreement to forward this response to Beachmount Mums Against Drugs, who had raised this. Um, so again, seek an agreement then to note, unless there are any other issues, the remaining correspondence. 91 there, Chair. Is it the table papers? Gordon, are they? Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think we've all had a copy of this paper. Yeah, 91, yeah. Oh, sorry. Right, we are to record, and we'll come back to that because that's actually under correspondence. Right, okay. We're, we're just finishing matters arising. That's what it was. Yeah. So under correspondence, again, there's. I'll run through these, and we'll come back to the, the issue that you raised, Gordon. There's 14 items of correspondence, <coughs> 12 items in the table folder, a number of them, um, and I think this may be this one. Oh no, it's not. Page 75 is correspondence from. And Mr. Nillens regarding possible changes in bylaws to promote safer tattooing. Um, I inform members that Mr. Nillens has been advised to, course, to forward his correspondence to the department for a response. Great. Great with that. Uh, page 89 of the tabled meeting folder is correspondence from Cancer Focus requesting to brief the committee on issues relating to the equal access to cancer drugs, which is provisionally scheduled for the meeting on the 26th of November. Um, so again, I'm seeking uh, agreement to request that Cancer Focus presents jointly with the APBNI on the issues involved. Great. 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 Um, again, Fergal, did you want to... Or no, Fergal, just, sorry. Uh, just I was nodding. Okay. Um, Gordon, on, on the correspondence issue? Yeah, and I want to, it came across my own desk. I think every member of the committee has had this correspondence. Yeah. What, how are we going to deal with it as, as a committee, I suppose? It would, in the normal manner, refer to local representatives, is that it? Yeah, I could. Yeah, I think, I think the, the advice is yes, there is a referral, and, it, and the correspondence has come across, I think, most of the MLAs. Anyway. Yeah. We had gone back to the... The department on this, and I think had we. I'm just looking to declare forwarded the response. Yes, chair. The committee, um, Ms. Nellis, had previously written to the committee, and the committee had written to the department on her behalf and received response and forwarded it back to her. This is a this is a second piece of correspondence. So, um, as the chair suggests, and maybe it's time now to to um, direct her to your constituency MLAs. Okay. Agreement. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Just happens to be the minister. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Well yeah. spotted. Yeah. Okay. Item twelve. Members, is any other business? Do members have any yeah. other business? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, members will, I hope, agree with me that we had a, a fairly successful um, debate on the report. 
um, on waiting time. I forget the, the title, the waiting time, and all the rest of it. And um, Mr. the Minister, Mr. Wells, I thought uh, um, answered the questions very favourably. And I'm talking about um, where and Paula, you, you, you'll, you'll agree with me about waiting times. I have I have certainly had correspondence from. Um, Warren Point, a, a patient in Warren Point who had been a, um, a victim of having been brought to the point where the operation was mm. was imminent, and then at the last minute it was cut away. Now there is now it wasn't performed. There is now extra funding for selective elective treatment, and I'm proposing that the committee would write to the minister on Mr Cunningham's behalf to get this. Um, through as quickly as possible, because the, the repercussions could be, you know, enormous in terms of this patient. And Paula, you you had a similar with your dad, I think it was yeah. actually. So in this instance, the, the the good positive vibes from the minister on that report would encourage us and hopefully the assembly committee to write to the minister on behalf of Mr Cunningham to get this operation through as soon as possible. Well, I, I think there's a number of things just in terms of protocol. We first of all need to see the response from the department. The five recommendations have been issued by dint of the inquiry that the committee has done. Um, I'm hoping that we will see response to that even within the next number of weeks. I think we need to reflect on what the department say on, on, at that point and decide on next steps. I do not necessarily think it would be, and I'll be guided by members, appropriate for the committee to write off on behalf of one constituent. Well, I mean, it's not only one, well, certainly in my case there's one, but there are probably hundreds out there that are waiting and have been disappointed because they, for whatever reason, funding wasn't there. But there is now extra funding going in to the elective care, and I think there was. It was uh, the minister did say. Um, I think we need to get some assessment on how this is going to because it causes enormous distress, and he wants to to, to, to do something about well, it. Can I suggest actually, because I'm just it, it has just occurred to me that that's through the monitoring round that additional elective care money. Right. So it's within anybody's gift to write off to the minister on, for for the breakdown. Plus, I would suggest to the the, the, the member concerned here that. We have asked for the breakdown of the money, that how it is going to be spent. We have asked that in the previous session with the department, which includes the elective care, which yeah. might give us more of a sense of how that will be spent. But you know, it is complete within anybody's gift here to write off on the basis of that decision that was taken during the week. I do think, in relation to the inquiry, uh, and, and I take your point, I think there was positive soundings around a number of the recommendations. We need to see that in writing. And going forward to decide. Well, it's in hand, sir, what the minister said, and he's encouraging people for to let him know. And here we have. A, I mean, I propose that the committee do write uh, on on certainly this this uh, um, this uh, John Cunningham from Warren Point, who is in a desperate need of of the operation. Um, and, and and let's take it from there. But you see, I, I think again. Here in most respect, and you know this as well, if not better than I do. Um, this is within your gift to do as a constituency, yeah, yeah. MLA. I don't think it's appropriate at this stage. And and we don't whilst we can see the, the member and other members and the minister's comments and answered, we need to get in writing the the response to the five recommendations. Because some of the recommendations may be taken forward and some may not. We don't know yet. And we don't know what that will mean, but there were five recommendations, and we need to get that response back. I would suggest we wait for that response coming in the next number of weeks, but that you certainly, by all means, take that issue directly yeah, up with the master. Yeah, I can do that. All right, no problem. But it would uh, be, have better support coming from the committee, all of the members of the committee. Well, I think, Very again, it's, it, it is. We are straying into an issue of an individual case. Uh, and the committee, I think, has been very, very clear to this point that we avoid that um, f by dint of being, I suppose, pulled into all sorts of clinical um, cases that was external to our remit. Uh, and, and again, I, you know, reiterating the point, you, as any other member, is completely within their right to do so. Could, could, can I ask, the Chair, did the committee? Clark, you have a copy of this request from from Moran Point. Uh, no, Chair. No, right. 
because I understood that they were to write to the committee. Well, I, I, I certainly haven't received any. So are, are we happy at this point? I mean, if it becomes an issue that the committee then have to reflect on, the committee can reflect on. But okay. at this point, it is something that is brought to your attention, and it's within your right and remit to do so. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Right, just to follow on from that, and I, I can fairly understand where you're coming from, Karen, because my, in my own father's case, he was sent home at 5 p.m. that last week, and being told he was sent home because the anaesthetist was sent home sick. Like it is scantless. Yeah. But Jim, or sorry, the minister did say that if we as individual MLAs came oh, to him, right. I've already put mine into writing and an email to him, mm -hmm. and I know he will. And I'm not, I didn't just do it because it's my father. I would do it for anybody and have done in the past. Mm -hmm. And we've all done it where we've written directly to the previous minister as well. And I, 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 I am 100% certain that he will follow it up as mm -hmm. soon as possible. It will be sent on to whoever needs to be sent on to. I think um, because this is, I know the way the committee works, that we don't do things personally from the committee. But I don't think it would be a bad idea to write to the Minister or the Department to look at those figures that are coming from the Trust. When was the last time we had? Because I haven't been on the committee for a while. Um, some of the figures of surgeries that have been either on the day of surgery or the day before surgery, where people have been told, and it's, it's, it's not just once, twice, some it's three and four times yeah. that people have been left. Um, so it might be good yeah, to get those okay. figures back. Okay. And that yeah, could yeah. maybe then heighten yeah. Tighten that yeah. up a bit because okay. it is. I know uh, at the, the debate on Monday was really my first time hearing everything that was going on and listening, and I, I just I really do wish I had been here for that. It was mm -hmm. such a good. It's it's such a very good. They're all the recommendations mm -hmm. the committee brought forward, and I would hope mm -hmm. that the minister uh, reflects on those and implements, if not all of them, most of them. Okay. No, I'm mm -hmm. happy to I do think that. that would give us a wee bit of back yep. as well to say, well, if you know. Okay. These are the figures, and this is where we are. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. I think that's useful. Um, I, I think also just on that, just to maybe formally thank the staff um, and the researchers for that yeah, here, here. piece of work as well. I think it was an important piece of work, mm -hmm. and there are very clear, practical recommendations uh, within such as well. So uh, I just want to personally acknowledge the work that people put into it, and of course the, the, the members and all of the people who came and presented as well in terms of evidence. Yeah. Okay. Um, finally, date, time, and place. The next meeting uh, is on Wednesday, the 19th of November. I'm reminding members that we have the question and effective question session next week. Um, Instead of the formal meeting from 2 o'clock to 4.45 in room 29, and then from 5 o'clock until 6.30 in room 115. Thank you.